Ms. Heather Brown, Assistant Director at Art Lab Australia, and all the dear participants, a very good afternoon to you all. I, Professor Preeti Mahajan, on behalf of the Department of Library Information Science, Punjab University, Chandigarh, and on my own behalf, welcome you all in the seventh webinar in the new series of the webinars entitled PU DLIS Webinar Series. The current series are being organized to reach out to LIS students, research scholars, and the professional colleagues to enhance their professional knowledge and update them in the field. I now take this opportunity to introduce the speaker of the webinar today. We have amongst us Ms. Heather Brown, who is an assistant director at Art Lab Australia, which is one of the Australia's leading conservation organization. Heather also has a part-time academic role at the University of South Australia, where she lectures to library and archive students. Heather is currently completing her PhD on the topic of physical and digital preservation management. Part of her research focuses on integrated disaster management, interlinking disaster management of physical as well as digital collections. She has authored many research papers, book chapters, conference papers, etc., on traditional preservation, conservation, preservation management, digital preservation, preservation microfilming and digitization, Indian manuscripts, etc. Heather has visited numerous cultural heritage mm -hmm. organizations across India and has delivered various lectures and sessions at Indian conferences, seminars, and professional events. In addition to her work in Australia and India, Heather has also delivered lectures and workshops in New Zealand, Singapore, Thailand, and the Philippines. Today, Ms. Brown would be speaking on disaster management and integrated approach. Without taking much time, I now hand over the proceedings to Ms. Brown. Ms. Brown, please. Thank you and namaste and satsrigal everyone. It is Thank such a, a great pleasure, Professor uh, Prishi. It's uh, such a great pleasure because as you will uh, discover during my session this afternoon, I'm actually Indian in my heart. So true. <laughs> very true. So um, it what it has been a number of years since I've travelled to Chandigarh, but I love. Chandigarh, it's a quite a unique city and I have visited your university as well and all around uh, the Punjab with some Sikh friends. So wonderful place and I love, especially love the chai, which has uh, more pepper in than uh, the okay. south. <laughs> so enough of that. Um, now, I've just a couple of uh, points before I start. The opinions in my presentation are my own, so please do not think that they are the opinions of my employing organisation, so I have to put that caveat in. And also that there is uh, some copyright um, material or are some copyright materials there, particularly some of the images. So without any further ado, I have some questions for you to think about in this presentation. So I know a number of you are already working in uh, libraries and archives and a number of you are students. So if you are not currently working in a library or archive, pretend that you will be in the future and think about these questions. So first of all, does your organisation or your future organisation have an up-to-date collection disaster plan? And by a collection disaster plan, I don't mean a disaster plan to evacuate people. I mean a disaster plan to safeguard a collection in the event of a disaster. The second question, does the plan cover digital as well as physical collections. Thirdly, think 
about your organization and what do you store off site? What do you store in the cloud? Physical and digital. So, for example, a number of the university libraries in India have uh, repositories, digital repositories, and a number of these are backed up. A number of them um, are backed up in the cloud and so forth. A number of the other large organisations, particularly like the National Archives, have physical collections stored off site as well. So where do you record this and is it in a disaster plan? So when a disaster happens, what are the priority collections to salvage in a disaster? It's like a fire in your own house. You know, what are you going to grab first? Apart from the people, what are you going to, to take first and, and care for as your number one priorities, physical and digital? What are the major risks to your collections? Does your library or your archive sit on the banks of a river, as a number of the libraries do in India, for example? Or are there other risks? And how can these risks be mitigated or reduced? And further along the line, how can you arrange disaster management training? And where might we go from this point? Can we start a community of practice in disaster management in India? And already that conversation is happening. And would you be interested in participating? So think about these questions as I give my presentation. So we'll start at the beginning and what may cause a collections disaster and I have to say that different countries and different professions define disasters slightly differently, but generally, generally disasters are seen as something large and catastrophic. And what does a disaster mean within a library or an archive? So let's look at some examples, and most of them are from India. So earthquakes, and I don't have one causing a collections disaster, but there's often earthquakes in India. Um, and here's one in Srinagar, um, obviously uh, damaging a bridge. But if your collections were there um, in a library nearby, they would be severely damaged. Some of you uh, from Delhi will re remember this, I do, um, the Museum of Natural History, the contents, the collections in there were completely destroyed by fire only a few years ago. So moving to digital collections, uh, fires happen to them and the Internet Archive, which a number of you would be knowing, um, had its building damaged by fire in 2013. And you would also recall the terrible damage in Brazil Museum not so long ago in 2018. And then in 2019, we had the terrible fire in Notre Dame that not only affected the physical structure, but some of the collections also the paintings and the relics and the artifacts were also damaged not as badly as as we thought but um, they were damaged and floods uh kerala floods in 2018 and last year i was talking to colleagues from the national archives who were called to help support uh, the, the local archives in Kerala because a number of their precious manuscripts and government records were totally destroyed and damaged uh, by the floods. And the Kashmiri floods in 2014 are another example. The Chennai floods, I recall those. Um, I was in Delhi at the time and um, I do also recall a number of people from the community trying to salvage the collections, uh, you know, and, and, and trying to care for these uh, water damaged um, items and uh, they're trying to do their level best, but they had no sense of what might be a priority to uh, salvage in the case of a disaster. 
And very recently, you would have all been reading in the news about the flood in Jaipur um, in the museum there. And uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Achal Pandya from Indira Gandhi National Centre for the Arts was recently in Jaipur helping them uh, trying to recover not only the mummy, which was uh, in the uh, news, but also a number of their rare and precious books uh, damaged by water. It happens in Australia as well. Australia has many examples of disasters. So here's a major one at one of Australia's uh, prominent universities. It's our national university. And in 2018, a violent storm hit that university. The rare books and the manuscripts were in the basement. And they got badly flooded and a number were lost. So you can just see um, images of some of the uh, water sodden collection items there. And another factor that is exacerbating or increasing the, the damage caused by weather is climate change. So in 2019, I went to a fantastic lecture by Robert Glasser, and you can see the reference to that at the bottom of the slide. Robert Glasser is an Australian academic and he has worked for the United Nations and his specialty is climate change and disasters. And he works for an organisation called the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. And in that lecture, he said the biggest threat to Australia is not an invasion or war, it's actually climate change because it's going to affect Australia so much that we're going to be entering this era of disasters, cascading disasters, where disasters are consecutive and simultaneously one disaster, then another one and another one. And we're already experiencing that in Australia, fires followed by floods, followed by storms, you know. So this is what's going to happen with climate change. In other words, it's going to get worse. And then there's man or human made disasters. So there's vandalism, it happens in Australia. And I pulled back, pulled out this one from India in 2005, although uh, when I was in Pune way back in the early 2000s at Vandaka Oriental Research Institute, Bori, that was attacked. There was uh, political uh, vandalism there. But in Manipur, a number of books were destroyed by arson attack. This is political damage. And you think that working in libraries is a safe, uh, very a pleasant experience? You can be caught in a disaster if your collection is uh, somehow becomes a political um, uh, powder keg and point for um, uh, different community factions. And to give you an international example of that, in Bosnia, the whole National Library and Archive was destroyed um, simply because people wanted to get rid of the cultural memory. So uh, all the press says at the time that the destruction of the National Library was um, destroyed an important part of Bosnia's cultural identity. And the reason for that was the different political groups were trying to, to get rid of the memory, the memory of their culture. So you can be working in the National Library in Bosnia and it can become a political target. And without a disaster plan, the whole collection can, can go. And then worse, um, at this time, um, and people in the, my colleagues in the National uh, Archives and National Library know this very well. Uh, perhaps not so much the universities in India, but some of the bigger organisations know that they are soft, we call that term soft targets in Australia. And what we mean is that um, if a terrorist group wants to attack, they haven't got a lot of security guards there. 
So they could be caught up in uh, one of those attacks. So I put a soft uh, target there to illustrate that this is a, a very real threat um, in India and, in fact, in a number of different countries as well. So uh, this time last year, um, Art Lab Australia joined with the Indira Gandhi National Centre for the Arts to um, start uh, to start a project on disaster management in India. And uh, on the left is my colleague uh, Achal Pandya um, and a number of other uh, representatives from um, organisations there. And they started the seminar and they shared very frankly what disasters had happened in their organisation. Some of them were security disasters and theft um, some of them were floods, some of them were fires, and none of those organisations had disaster plans. That was quite uh, revealing. Um, so it was a very good time to start that conversation happening. But disasters can be small also, and I just want to move into the next slides as well, because small events like a leak and an overflowing gutter um, can result in mould attack. And uh, insects or vermin, you know, mice, rats attacking can uh, result in disasters in your collection. And think about now where collections are locked down in a, during a pandemic. Some of them have been locked down and unattended for months. What are the risks? And what are the risks to digital collections during the pandemic? Because in my own workplace, the security uh, levels went up immediately. We weren't allowed to use thumb drives or anything working from home because of the risks of virus and that being transmitted to other parts of the collection. So think about what happens during a pandemic, not only to physical collections, but digital collections as well. And the small disaster, even the smallest one, will result in additional work required by staff. So here's an example of um, a trying to recover from a small disaster at one of the um, American libraries. And here's a photograph taken at Art Lab. And it's a disaster affecting a museum collection. You can see the moths or the butterflies on the left have been eaten by other insects and they've made quite a meal of that. Uh, so that's an example of um, insect disasters, which you won't hear. Uh, you have to see and inspect the collections to see those kinds of disasters happening, especially if they happen to be your rarest collection of butterflies. However, having said that, for physical collections, most of the damage comes from water because even if there's a fire, usually the collections are water damaged as the fire brigade pours in the water. And then if you don't respond quickly, then you get mould damage as well. And think about the collections to digital materials. Uh, they can be viruses, but also what about the digital materials contained in physical carriers as well? And here's some more examples. Um, on the bottom left-hand side, you can see a physical carrier, um, a CD, uh, that's been totally damaged. The surface of that has been damaged by wet. And the other collections are physical. You can see tide marks. And right on the bottom, you can see mould happening as well. So that's the kind of damage you see from a disaster. A disaster also affects staff. And I'm giving you an example from my own workplace. This photograph was taken right outside uh, Art Lab Australia, where I work. And the building that uh, is, has the glass windows is our South Australia Museum. And one day, the uh, truck outside the outlet building, the truck hit a fire hydrant. And the fire hydrant burst and out poured all this water down the slope towards the museum. 
And in that museum is housed, you can see some skeletons and so forth, but it's also housed one of the most fabulous rare collections in Australia. It's called the Sir Douglas Mawson Collect Collection. And Sir Douglas Mawson was an Antarctic explorer and all his diaries and his manuscripts were there. So all the water's pouring out. You can see my colleagues there. You can see, make out, they've got brooms and they've all got rubber boots on. And you can see the green sandbag going around. And so they're, they're successfully pushing the water away and uh, they're prepared for this disaster. And I'll talk about uh, disaster equipment that you have on hand. And they managed to whoosh the water away. We turned the fire hydrant off and the disaster was averted. But you can see you need a, a team of staff ready to respond um, and avert disasters. And it wasn't very hard to avert that disaster, but you do need trained staff. So this is all very well, but uh, what you actually need to do, reflecting on all these types of disasters, what do we need to do to safeguard collections? And the solution really is developing a disaster management program. And that involves planning and assessing risks, identifying the risks, and then finding ways of reducing the risks, and then thinking of ways that you will respond and recover afterwards. So that, in a nutshell, is disaster management. And the benefits of disaster management are that you're going to have less damage to the collections. You're going to be able to respond more quickly because you're ready to go. And if you've identified some of the risks at the beginning, then hopefully you've knocked out some of the problems in the first place. So you're less likely to experience a disaster. So that's the benefits of disaster management. But stop again, this is all very well, but are we, I asked the question, and this was the, one of the questions I asked when I was doing my PhD thesis, are we only seeing part of the picture? Are we only seeing half of the story? And I asked this question because Many significant collections that we work with as librarians and archi archivists, many of our significant collections are digital and they're also physical. So that's sometimes called hybrid collections. So, you know, we've got these two sorts of collections happening, but as librarians, we think of them as just the one collection, don't we? That, this is our collection. It's books in physical form. There's e-books, you know, it's our collection. And in India, the collections are physical and digital. And I'll give you some examples, even from archives. When I visited the Sri Aurobindo archives on the left-hand side, I was very um, lucky uh, to see the physical collections, Sri Aurobindo's writings, which are being superbly cared for by the conservators in their storage area on the left-hand side. But on the right-hand side, a lot of the records of what's been digitised, et cetera, are in digital form. So it's a hybrid collection. And when I go to visit the Indira Gandhi National Centre for the Arts, I find the National Mission for Manuscripts has physical collections like palm leaf manuscripts, but also they have an incredible digital collection. And if I go to the National Library in Kolkata, of course it has physical collections and, and there's a shot from the reading room but also uh, like a number of different uh, libraries and archives in India, the uh, National Library is also digitising and at the moment is involved with the British Library in digitising Bengali uh, materials. So hybrid collections. But there's a problem when it comes to disaster management, and this is where my research was, was showing this up, 
In disaster management, there's a divide. And you can see on this slide, I've done, I've made two parallel lines. And one of them is physical and one of them's digital. Because my research was showing that not only in Australia, but in all the literature that was coming through, there's very little connection between the physical and the digital in disaster management. So typically, where organisations have disaster plans, they're uh, located with the physical collections. So libraries will say, oh, we have a disaster plan. And when you unpack that plan and have a look at it, it's mainly dealing, mainly dealing with the physical collections. And then when you um, investigate what's happening with the digital disaster management, it's definitely happening. But it, um, and you have to ask the questions and talk to the, we call them the IT staff or the ICT staff or the digital staff. They've got the they've got the the planning there, but it's it's often in the heads of the IT people, and it's not connected in any way with the physical collections. And I found that quite astonishing. So that's that kind of led me into more research. So I asked the question as part of my PhD: Is it possible? Is it possible to develop one disaster plan? Because after all, you know, as a librarian myself, I think of the collection as just one collection. It's got lots of different formats. So is it possible to develop one disaster plan that would cover the whole collection? And I did my research in the major Australian state libraries and our national library because they have a mandate, a, a legal mandate to preserve their collections. And I also focused with S, what I've called SLQ on the bottom, which stands for the State Library of Queensland, and asked them if they would agree to participate in what I called a proof of concept, which is like a pilot. And the reason why I asked Queensland is that Queensland sits uh, right up the top of Australia. Brisbane sits right up near the top. And they had a terrible flood in 2011. So the uh, State Library of Queensland Library sits on the bank of a river. And when the, when the flood happened, uh, it came very quickly and affected both the digital and the physical collections. So they were a good library to work with because they could tell me what had happened, how it affected both of the collections. So unfortunately, uh, they agreed to help me when I did my research. So when I was investigating, is it possible to have one disaster plan that covered digital and physical collections? And I started to work with the State Library of Queensland staff. I found that, in fact, there, there wasn't a lot of difference between the two. In fact, digital disaster planning and physical disaster planning is built on the same principles. And those principles are to do with risk management. Now, I know that uh, some of you are already researching in this area, so you'll be knowing uh, risk management as it relates to trusted digital repositories, but also the physical disaster management is also built on risk management. Both physical and digital disaster management are linked with those four stages of uh, disaster management. Before is prevention and preparation, and then response and recovery. Those four stages are common to both physical and digital uh, disaster management. And also the concept of scale of disaster applies to both collections. So if you have a, a large disaster, that concept of is it large scale applies to both physical as well as digital collections. So this common foundation was there. And so as I worked through this with State Library of Queensland staff, I found that in terms of the, the findings, we, we still needed to keep specialist roles in a disaster management um, 
uh, program. So we still needed people who could respond to a disaster who had skills with digital collections. So they, they may be your IT staff, they may be librarians who have those digital skills. And there will also need people who have skills in caring for or responding to disasters as they, they affect physical collections as well. And what, what is interesting or what I think might happen in the future is as our roles as, of, as librarians evolve, that uh, these two roles might join and librarians in maybe five years or 10 years will have both of those skills. But at the moment, uh, there's still a need for those two roles. So uh, both physical and digital are built on risk management principles. But it wasn't a matter of just going into an existing disaster plan, which Queensland and most of the libraries had, uh, and that the disaster plans were focusing on the physical collections. I couldn't just go into them and write in the word digital. I had to think about business continuity and risk management and other sorts of documents and planning. Uh, in other words, the ecosystem of the organisation. And this is where I think India is, is just so far advanced in Indian thinking because you can see those malas, those beautiful garlands there, and they symbolise interconnection. So in introducing uh, integrated disaster management, it's about interconnection with the whole ecosystem of the organisation. So uh, it's kind of like driving through Indian traffic and I've been through the traffic at Chandigarh with all the, the motorbikes and everything. You know, it's kind of just this interconnected weaving as people go through. So it's it's about realising that there's a whole ecosystem there. So um, uh, because I love India so much and because my heart's Indian, I think that, that India out of all of the countries will understand this concept of interconnection because it's already part of the Indian experience of everyday life. So I've talked about the need for the two uh, coordinator roles now, but I'm, I'm challenging and saying that maybe in the future those barriers or those specialisations won't be there because our future librarians will have both of those roles together. And in responding to a disaster, the digital coordinator and the physical coordinator would respond to, to a supervisor further up the line who would link them together in a, a disaster scenario. So there would be a chain of command. So what were the findings of the research? Uh, for the major benefit was that um, it was very useful to have in one place a list of where everything is in the organisation. If your digital collections are backed up, if they're stored in the cloud, then put them in the disaster plan. Similarly, if you have physical collections off-site, list them in the disaster plan. And then you know if a disaster strikes, then if your digital collections are backed up in the cloud, you probably don't have to worry about them, you know, but it's listed there, it's not in someone's head. So there are benefits in having a one-stop shop. Um, and as I said, in, in most of the cases when I was interviewing uh, the, the uh, staff in the various libraries in Australia, this was happening in, in the digital area, but it wasn't written down anywhere. So the benefits of having an integrated plan is that it's bringing together both the physical and the digital and listing what's happening in one place. So it, I also tested to see if the resulting plan would be huge because we didn't want anything too thick and we managed to whittle it down to something quite small and having the areas of specialisation in the appendices. So if you wanted to have a specialist response for the digital collections, that was in the appendix and clearly separated from the physical collections. So the plan itself was quite uh, thin. So that, that was good news. So the next question is what 
does an integrated disaster management plan look like? So I've given you some Indian food as a little taste and say, and say that there is a recipe and the recipe for you is some disaster management resources which are free. They're available for you to download from the Australian Library and Information Association. That's called ALIA. And those disaster management resources were written uh, jointly by myself and another wonderful colleague from the State Library of Queensland. And the part that's in brown on the cover is a guide and introduction. And the part that's green is actually a template for putting together a disaster plan. So they're available free for you to download. And there are additionally some training scenarios as well that you can use. So when you open those disaster resources, you'll find that they focus on those four essential elements or stages. Before a disaster is prevention and preparation, during is your response, and afterwards is the recovery. And the the most important parts are actually before the prevention and the preparation uh, rather than the response and the recovery. Because if you put more effort into the foundation, then you're less likely to experience a disaster in the first place. So prevent, uh, prevention is the actions taken to reduce the impact of a disaster or prevent it. And what you need to do for that is to undertake a risk assessment of the collection and the building. And in the digital area, look at what might be the digital security risks. Now, those of you who are doing research into digital disaster preparedness would already be doing this in the, the paradigm of a trusted digital repository. So it's the same issue. So when you uh, reduce the risk, you uh, develop a risk management plan. And certainly one of the big issues for on-site collections is building maintenance. Here's an example from the workshop that uh, my colleague from Art Lab, Angelina, myself ran jointly with IGNCA staff last year. And we had a number of colleagues um, and we took them through doing risk assessments. So we actually used the, the wonderful library, uh, which is run by uh, uh, Dr. Ramesh Gower at IGNCA. And we found some risks in that library and we, we identified the risks and we also identified how we might reduce them. And we also looked at another area of IGNCA, which uh, was in the basement area, which had water. Uh, it was a building maintenance problem and we uh, identified ways of reducing the risk. And so here you can see uh, the participants presenting very simply ways to reduce the risk, very practical ways. So that took them probably um, an hour, maybe an hour and a half. It wasn't hard to do. And uh, we have a saying in Australia, it's not rocket science. You know, it's not a difficult thing to do. So they were able to identify the risks and also more importantly, sensible practical ways to reduce them, like getting things up off the floor or moving them away from the window ledge. And some of you may be knowing Dr. Ja from the cultural informatics section. Um, so he gave a whole presentation on how disaster management is integral to a trusted digital repository. So again, those of you who are doing research in that area, Dr. Ja is a very useful person, a wonderful colleague uh, who you should talk to as well. So then as part of the preparation stage, that's the actions that you take before the disaster happens and you develop a disaster plan and you form disaster teams. So when you put together your disaster plan, you start prioritising your collection. What parts of your collection are unique? 
What parts of the collection can be replaced? What is rare? What is significant? And what already has other copies? So that example um, about 15 minutes ago where I showed the slides of what happened in Chennai and all of those books lying there, and I said a number of people from the community tried to salvage. And what they did, they, they were just running to salvage anything they could. So they were trying so hard and they were trying fiction books, you know, books that were in print books that could be replaced possibly in the future. Whereas if you think about your collections first and you think about what is unique, what is rare in your organisation. So in a university library, it may well be the university repository of theses or uh, research papers written by university staff. That's possibly going to be unique to the, the university library collection, or you may have some rare books, or you may have some manuscripts or archives. So they're your most important things. Otherwise, your da digital databases, you can probably recover, you know, or your fiction books, you can probably recover. So think about what's your priorities. And, you know, you won't be able to save everything, but if you know where your priority collections are, then that's the one you, that you go for in the event of a disaster. So preparation also involves uh, what I call stockpiling or bringing together emergency equipment. And what that little slide I showed of the staff from Art Lab out there with the brooms and the rubber boots, that's that little stockpile of emergency equipment. You can see it's not, you know, it's not a hard thing to do. We have, um, and Dr. Achal Pandian now knows about this too, we have little disaster bins, wheel, bins with wheels on, rubbish bins. And in those, we put our disaster equipment and we have sheets of plastic and rubber boots and uh, other things and we seal them so they don't get stolen, but we keep them handy in the event of a disaster and very useful to have, uh, you know, towels so you can mop up water. And uh, you have this emergency equipment ready. And most importantly, also, you start training your staff in how to respond in the case of a disaster, what to do if your collections are water damaged, which is what we were doing at our GNCA. So here we are, um, and that's my colleague Anne Dineen from um, Art Lab and some of the other participants, and we're and the student, uh, the, the participants, um, some of them conservation students are, are putting together their disaster plan. And again, they, it didn't take them a long time. They used the template from the um, Alia. A template and they put together a disaster plan for their own organisation or an imaginary organisation if they weren't yet working in one. So it wasn't difficult to do. So what are the kinds of things that go into a plan? Again, you have to look inside the ALIA uh, disaster resources and that part two, that green one, is, is the section where you can find the contents of your disaster plan. So right at the front is going to be the list of who you're going to call. The fire brigade, the police, and who's head of your disaster team. You know, and it's going to have phone numbers and all sorts of things there. But also the disaster plan, you can't put copies everywhere. Some of that, that information is confidential. So you also need to keep it uh, confidential as well. And if you've got a list of what your priority salvage materials are, you'd want to keep that confidential as well. Because if there is a, a terrorist attack or a security issue, it's also a signal to a burglar of where your uh, rare books are. So you've got to be very careful about where you keep the plan and who has access to it as well. So if
if your disaster is happening as it did at Art Lab and the truck hit the fire hydrant or as it did in some of the other scenarios, then you have to respond to it. So your immediate response is, first of all, you take care of the people and then you look what you can do to control the disaster. So you might turn off the water, work through a safety checklist and then cover some of the collection items with covers or plastic, contact emergency services, call the fire brigade or whatever. So that's the immediate response. And then the next step after the response is the recovery. So um, this little uh, slide is a segue or a, a transition into the recovery and it's inside the conservation lab in Indira Gandhi National Centre for the Arts. And that little bin that you can see there, the green bin, uh, that's exactly the kind of bin that I was talking about that we keep our disaster supplies in as well. We keep our brooms standing on the outside. So we're setting up an area here for recovery. We've got some paper there and some paper towels and plastic, and we're going to do a response to a disaster. So we're going to uh, recover. And what we did overnight was we got a trough and we soaked some materials in overnight. And we found, you can see the little books there are bleeding, the colour of them's looking really yucky and brown. And we put in some uh, fabric material as well. And we wanted everyone to experience what it's like once material becomes wet and soggy and fragile. And some of the paper-based materials, particularly coated paper, the shiny paper, it starts sticking within a few hours. So you have to respond to that quickly. So we learned all about that. And then we practised how to prioritise material. So instead of rushing in, we did a plan of how to respond and how to prioritise which items we were going to, to retrieve first. And then in the uh, conservation lab, we practice lifting the material out very carefully and putting interleaving sheets of paper and putting fans on to keep the environment and the air flowing and rescuing, salvaging the material. What we also learned that was uh, when you have over 500 books damaged, it's very hard for a team of people to respond quickly. So what you need to do then is to freeze them. So again, that's not a concept in India, but it's very much used in Australia. So Dr. Achal Pandey is looking into uh, trying to set up around India arrangements for uh, like Mother Dairy or some of the other organisations where books can be packed, wet books can be packed, and you can't just put them in without putting them in plastic but you pack them in crates and freeze them and in these big freezers and then that buys you time for the future. So once you've got over 500 collection items damaged, as happened actually in Jaipur, you're better off freezing them straight away and then dealing with them later. So that was part of the training as well. So very interesting. So that's all very well. Uh, what's what's the next big thing for India? And what uh, the idea that Dr. Pandya and uh, and I and my colleagues from Art Lab were having is we were and also the National Library of India and the National Archives and also Delnet is, is also thinking along the same lines. Could we start building this community of practice in India? like building up the skills um, in disaster management. And um, one of the best places to start um, and I've, uh, is actually in the library schools like yours. So embedding the knowledge and skills in library and information science education programs. So I've got a lovely yoga pose there 
of these ripples going out, but starting at the foundation of library, library and information science programs, because this is where the teaching and the research and the education is going on. And you can see like the trees coming out. So it could spread from there. So it's at the early stages at the moment. And we would have loved, I would have loved to have been in India building on this, you know, this year, but I can't because of COVID. But what I can do is spread the message and say that if you are interested in doing that, please contact me, but also uh, please be in contact with uh, Dr. Achal Pandya um, in Indira Gandhi National Centre for the Arts and a number of the other organisations are interested as well. So another little tip, remember the ALIA disaster management resources, they're free. You can download them and uh, they're also very flexible. So you can tailor them according to the need of your organisations. I also popped in there some references to uh, disaster resources um, and resources on collection care during a pandemic. So the one on the bottom comes from the Australian Institute of Conservation and the other ones from the Canadian uh, Conservation Institute as well. Some simple practical things on how to care for your collections during a disaster because you're going to get mould, you're going to get insects possibly attacking those collections. And then finally, I would just love to say thank you so much to Professor Preeti and wonderful colleagues, uh, to my fabulous colleagues at the Indira Gandhi National Centre for the Arts, especially Dr. Achal Pandya, and to my colleagues at Art Lab, including Anne Janine and my boss, uh, Andrew Durham. And thank you to all of you because it's just so wonderful to connect with India. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Brown. Uh, thank you very much for highlighting the need of having an integrated approach to disaster management, which may be physical or uh, digital. And especially you have taken the examples from India, which really suited these words, especially the picture of the chart, which you have shown to us in the lecture. Anyway, uh, I do agree because one of uh, the results of our study also are the similar to your study. That means uh, which uh, which indicates that there are no disaster plans for the digital object. This is very true. I think uh, Harpreet would like to uh, give you more information about this. But before that, uh, may I request Neha to take the questions and answers, please? Good evening, ma'am. It was a wonderful presentation. I am sure it's easy. So now I can't see any questions as such because there's none in the chat box and everything. It was very well explained and very well executed step and systematically. So I could request uh, her pre the research scholar of AP ma'am that she should share her viewpoint about this. Thank you. Hello, good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Harpreet, <laughs> you can put on your video also. Yes, ma'am. Video on, Carlo. Ji, ma'am. Done, ma'am. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Good evening, ma'am. Harpreet, this side, I'm also working on disaster management in libraries of Northwest India. Yes. Sure. Uh, I have two queries, uh, and I, you are the best person who can clarify regarding this. Ma'am, uh, uh, you have pointed out that there should be a different disaster management plan for the physical and the digital collection. Ma'am, what kind of plan do you have in your library? Do you have separate plans or there is just one? We've got, uh, we have just created a revolution and we have won. <laughs> so I'm okay. actually saying that it's, it is possible to have won. It is possible. Um, and so the um, resources from the Australian Library and Information Association, the ALIA resources, have a template that is one integrated plan 
But those resources are flexible. They're flexible like knitting something. So you can unpick them and have just the physical plan or just the digital plan, whatever you wish. Yes. So they're very flexible so according to the need of the organisation. But what I think the benefit of having both of them there is at least you're thinking about the risks to both of the collections. And let me tell you a story of what happened in Queensland, which is why I, I really wanted to work with them. In 2011, when the Brisbane River was rising, rising, rising on the banks and the State Library was there, their biggest risk was their digital collections at the time. Why was that? At that time, their backup was, they didn't have the cloud backup. Okay, so their server, the power cut, and their server that had all their digital collections was in danger of overheating. They had 15 minutes to shut that server down. Okay, now it's different. Now they've got, you know, cloud storage and everything. But at that time, they had 15 minutes to shut the server down. Now, if you know anything about digital collections, you can't just go shut. You have to have the right person with the authority to shut down those digital collection, you know, to shut the server down properly. So the number one priority for Queensland was not the rare books at that time. It was getting that server shut down in the first 15 minutes. So having that in their disaster plan at that time would have been very useful, you know, because it would have said the priority was actually their digital collection over the physical collection. So that really started me thinking about the advantage of having the two together. Okay, uh, ma'am, one more thing I would like to ask. Uh, yes. Yeah, ma'am, uh, do you think that the cloud computing or the cloud servers we are using these days for the, like the cloud, uh, Google Cloud or something, are they safe for the preservation part? <laughs> that's, a, that's your risk management uh, that you have to do a risk assessment. So uh, the cloud is uh, stored somewhere on a server, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. You know, wherever it is. So you have to think about where the server is. And I, I had a lovely conversation a few years ago at an ICDL conference in Delhi with someone from the archives in Israel, you know, the, right. the National Archives of Israel. Now, you would be knowing when I say that, that they are very nervous about risk and where their digital collections will be, uh, where their cloud is backed up. And so I was very naughty. I went up to the the man from the archives and I said, "Oh, uh, where do you, where? Can, I know this is secret, but uh, do you back up your cloud? You know, in Israel?" And he said, "No." I said, "Ah, so you do that in another country?" And then I was even naughtier. I said, "I said, do you have your backup in America?" He looked at me shocked because he wasn't going to tell me anyway. But he said, "No." So, so you know, the risk—they've uh, already thought about their risks and where their cloud is backed up. So you would be knowing doing the research of locks, the locks program, which coordinates multiple copies, synchronized copies um, yes. in, in uh, various organizations. So that has disaster management in its framework. And yes. I think that you, uh, you will know that, uh, you know, there's countries, uh, it goes across different countries as well. So depending on how vulnerable or how risky your collection is, you might join a LOX consortium and have your collection backed up. But, you know, if you're the National Archives in Israel, you're going to be high risk. You've got one of those targets on you, haven't you? Whereas if you are uh, possibly, if you're New Zealand, you probably haven't because New Zealand's not so controversial, you know? So you have to think about risk all the time. But a number of organisations still keep their digital collections backed up on LTO tapes, don't they? Tapes that are stored off site. Uh, and where are they listed? Uh, they should be listed in the disaster plan, surely. <laughs> 
you know, oh, yes. and, and usually it's someone's in someone's head. So with yes. your references, um, have a look at uh, at the locks program. And also I was looking, I can send you some other references as well, but Nancy McGovern and uh, Stuchel have also done uh, Cornell University disaster uh, planning policy framework. So I can send some references as well. So that will help you in your research. So the cloud, always remember the clouds on a server somewhere and where is the risk to that? And that means the risk management crisis, hazard assessment, all these should be done before making the disaster management plan. And this correct, part of correct. Plan. correct, correct, correct. Um, uh, I would so, love to uh, read your thesis. It will be nice of you if you share your uh, research with me. Not yet. <laughs> well, it's not, not yet. Thesis. <laughs> not yet, perfect. Okay. Under evaluation. Or, okay, ma'am, uh, after the evaluation, that's done. That's done. Ma'am, uh, yes. can you share your written document of disaster management with me? Yes, um, the um, ALIA disaster management resources are already there, and I can share a link to an article that I wrote for the Australian. Uh, it's called JALIA, a journal on that, and that will have a, a, a reasonable literature review in there as well. So I can uh, give that as well to uh, Dr. Preeti. So I will pass those links on. Okay? Yeah, I'll certainly do that. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for listening oh, to good. me. Very good luck. Very good Bye. luck with your research. Yes. Yeah, sure, ma'am. I'll definitely share my research paper also whenever it comes into the publication. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Kaur. Uh, ma'am, in the meantime, there is a question. Ms. Brown, with your permission, should I take up the question? Yes. Uh, what was your preparation and response to preserve digital assets when bushfires swept over Australia? Is the question mm. Yeah, so um, in Australia, there's usually a lot of the a lot of the the uh, larger libraries have disaster plans in place, uh, and the public libraries don't. So, the, but the collections in the public libraries that are the most vulnerable are the ones that are the local history collections. They are unique. So they will be the little histories of the area, the photographs, um, and perhaps oral history recordings. So unfortunately, if those public libraries don't have disaster plans, then they, they, the libraries could be burnt down. Um, and that has happened not so much in the recent bushfires, but one about 10 years ago in Victoria, uh, quite a few library uh, local history collections were burnt. So uh, I'm hoping that more organisations in Australia will also do disaster plans. So it's it's people think it's hard to do, you know, but it's it's really it's like in your own house, you know, what are you going to put together? to reduce the risks and what are going to be your priority materials if there's a fire you know it'll be you know my passport a wedding certificate my husband the cat what could you you know and, and you know and then then i will go you know i'll have my priorities there very yeah true, very true yeah very true. so yeah. it's the same principles yeah that's yeah, right. sorry, you know, risk, risk management. There's a lovely saying also, who guards the guards? And uh, in Australia, uh, you might have been reading during the pandemic, in one of our states, we had the security guards uh, not being, uh, not behaving properly. No one was guarding the guards. So the whole pandemic went through the state of Victoria. You know, so often in the collections, 
the particularly the museum collections and i was talking to colleagues in indonesia a few weeks ago it was actually the enemy is within the guards were actually responsible for thieving you know the materials so you have to that's risk management you have to look at at the guards and that's saying that the enemy's within very tricky <laughs> Yes, that's true. It's risk management. Question? Neha? Um, there is not any question. As someone has asked about uh, how successful. I'm not clear, so I've asked them to clarify the question as such. Because how successful is a very open-ended question. Mm. What success are they talking about? It's not clear. So I don't know. I'll, should yeah. we wait for the person to respond back? Just wait. Mm. Uh, here it is. How successful are the disaster management plans amid COVID-19? It's hard. Um, my response is it's hard to tell um, at this stage, but I can tell you uh, from the point of view of Art Lab where I work, we have uh, risk disaster plan and risk mitigation strategies in place. So we are constantly checking the collections that are locked down. So we're doing a patrol through. We are looking at the vulnerable parts of the collections where we know the roof has a leak and the gutters need to be cleaned. We're checking, 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 checking. And we're also looking for insect infestation and we have what we call blunder traps, sticky traps to catch the insects, to tell us if there's insects uh, we're also checking for um, vermin, looking for uh, rats, mice droppings. You can see if rats or mice are having a party. So we're doing those regular checks. And I have to say, we've been very successful in that. There's been no disaster of that kind. And all of those uh, cultural organisations that ArtLab's responsible for, they all have disaster plans and we update them every 12 months. So all the contact lists, everything, and the training every 12 months we do. Very important. Mm. Neha, there is a question in the chat also from Ashish. Have you taken this yes, up? What were your Man, just, It just came up. OK. As corona is also a man-made disaster, <laughs> how you imagine post-corona libraries? Yeah. How do I imagine? What was the question? Uh, Post-corona libraries. Imagine post-corona well, libraries, yes. Yeah, I think they will still have digital and physical collections uh, for the time being. In the future, I think more may be digital. But in India, in India, the land of the universe, I think that there will still be physical collections and why I'm saying that is that India's treasure is actually its manuscript collections. Sure. And the manuscripts yes. in India are worshipped. Um, and the holy books are worshipped, just like in a Sikh temple, you have the holy book, it is cared for, it's preserved, it's brought out. So because the physical items are, have that significance, I think in a, a country like India, there will always be these hybrid collections. And that's why I, I love India. And that's why uh, India gave me the idea of this integrated uh, disaster plan and an integrated uh, approach to uh, preservation as well. Because in India, everything's connected. <laughs> Yeah. Usually also everything is connected, ma'am. Like we got connected with you yes. during this period. Otherwise, they would not have not, not to happen. Yes. <laughs> correct. Oh. Correct. There's also, you know, it, it, everything is connected. So, uh, but but the problem is with in nowadays with all these specialisations, people work in their own little. We call them silos. You know, so. Right. And we don't learn from one another. But when I started unpacking disaster plans for physical and digital, they're exactly the same. Same kind of principles, same steps, you know. What's so different? Except 
except when you get to the final stage, you need specialist skills to deal with the digital and specialists to deal with the physical. But similarly, in a physical situation, you need to know how to uh, rescue photographs as opposed to how to rescue paintings. And then you need people knowing how to rescue the, the digital materials. Um, at that very granular level, you do need that, those in-depth skills. But further up, the management is the same. <laughs> well, we try to learn by example instead of learning by experience in this case. And we get a chance. Now, thank you so yes. much for your time, Ms. Brown. Now I would... Professor Rupak, Rupak Chakravati to take up the vote of thanks. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Neha. Am I audible? Yes, yes sir. Yes. So like uh, either Brown said, disasters don't give prior intimation before their occurrence. What is required is preparedness and readiness, which in turn requires awareness and sensitization. It was indeed a pleasure and privilege for us to listen to this either. It was like mind-blowing presentation and this bit full of content. And uh, she focused on connecting the dots between the physical preservation and digital preservation. And she presented upon one common, comprehensive, complete plan, a syndicated plan. So it was a wonderful, it was wonderful to have you, ma'am, in this webinar. And I am on behalf of all of us here and the Punjab University Department students, all of the participants. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for sparing valuable time for, from a busy schedule and educating us on a very, very, you can say, important uh, topic. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, thank you, so you Mr. So no, thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you very much for being a great there. Great pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> And also, uh, it's uh, someday I will be able to see you in person. <laughs> certainly, certainly. You're most welcome. Whenever you, you come here, do meet us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.